Okay, so today I want to just preach on the topic of why bad things happen. Why bad things happen. Um, I have preached about this in the past, but a lot of you guys weren't there for that sermon. So I'm just preaching on this again. So for those of you who heard this sermon, um, it may be a lot of repeat, but a good reminder for us as well um, about why th bad things happen and why God allows bad things to happen in our lives. Now, I just wanted, I just wanted to say something, because one, one thing, one thing um, Stephen Anderson did mention in his video is just us being a PowerPoint church. And, I, and a lot of you guys don't know why, you know, you know, am I just using a projector? Am I just using PowerPoint just to be contemporary, just to be liberal? No, of course not. I actually thought this through when I started this church, why I, why I wanted to use a projector and why I wanted to use PowerPoint. Um, and there's a couple of reasons. I mean, none of us here are against using technology to make our lives easier, right? I mean, that's why, that's why we use email, right? That's why we use the internet. We're not, like, I'm not sending out a, a, a paper newsletter and mailing it to your house every week. Like, I, that's why I use WhatsApp, I use Facebook, because I'm not against technology. Like, technology makes our life easier, it makes us more efficient, and technology can make a church more efficient. You know, that's why you can have live streams, you can do things like that. It's just using technology to make things more efficient. Um, so unfortunately, sometimes in the fundamental circles, you know, we're just holding on to the things just for the sake that they're old, you know, rather than actually thinking about better ways to do things. So the reason why, there's a couple of reasons why um, I decided to use PowerPoint. Number one is I wanted to keep everyone on the same page because sometimes when you're, you're in a church and you have somebody preaching at the front, you know, they're flipping through their Bible, they're already there, but you're not there either and you lose the place, you've missed what they've said, you're not on the same page. Whereas I feel that when I project what I'm preaching on up there, everybody is on the same page. Nobody's wondering what verse I'm preaching on, where I'm at, what I'm referring to. We're all learning and, and focused on the same thing. Um, and this is why I use that Bible program because I, I, when I was first thinking, you know, when I started this church, I mean, it'd be great if I was using a Bible, you guys could see what I was seeing, you know, like you know exactly what page I'm turned to. So I, I decided, well, why don't I just use an electronic Bible and turn there and then everybody knows exactly where I'm turned to. So that, that was one reason. Another reason is if you use things like hymn books, sometimes you, have, you buy too many, sometimes you don't have enough. Sometimes you need to buy more and things like that. Whereas if I just put the hymns onto a PowerPoint, it doesn't matter how big our church is. Our church can be big, our church can be small, and, and we're all singing the hymns, we're all singing at the same time. You know, this just was one thing I didn't have to worry about. You know, and hymn, hymn books cost money. I already had a projector, I already had a laptop, so why, buy, why spend money on books? Right? So that sort of was the thinking there with, um, with, the hymnal, with the hymns. Now, the other thing is, you know, with a, with a, with a PowerPoint is that I can, I can underline words and I can do things like that that you can't do. But one of my main reasons why I decided to use PowerPoint is because one thing I realized when, when me and my wife went to a church that didn't use PowerPoint, it was really difficult for my wife to follow along. Why? Because she's holding a baby. She's dealing with kids. She sometimes has to go to the back and stand up. So yeah, if you're like, a, you know, a, a, an old preacher or an old church member whose kids are grown up, or you're a single guy, you know, uh, a couple, a married couple that doesn't have any kids, yeah, sure, you can hold a hymn book, you can hold a Bible, and you can flip and carry a lot, a turn along. But I thought we were meant to be a family-friendly church. Right? So th this is why. It's a family-friendly church. We want your kids sitting here in with us. And if your kids are going to be here, then you're going to have to deal with them, right? You're going to have to hold your baby. You're going to have to deal with your kids. How are you going to do that if you're holding a Bible and you're holding a hymn book at the same time? Right? So that's, why, that's one of my main driving reasons why I think this is a good idea. Because I wanted mothers to be able to deal with their kids, stand up at the back, like Nathan, dads as well, like Nathan standing up at the back now with his kid and still know what I'm preaching on and not have to turn in a Bible or hold a hymn book at the same time. So there's that. And people might say things like, oh, you know, but don't you want people to learn, you know, in their Bibles and turn in their Bibles? You know, church is not where you learn where the books of the Bible are. I mean, you should be learning that in your own personal Bible reading at home. You should be reading the Bible every day, getting familiar with it. You don't, you know, not touch your Bible all week and then you come to church and that's when you practice turning in your Bible to what books and then you're missing everything that's being preached because, you know, that's where you think you're meant to learn it and you're turning while people are preaching. Um, it also makes, you know, my sermon a lot more efficient in the sense that I don't need to tell you, let's turn there and, and let's turn there, you know, 20 times in a sermon and use up 10 minutes of my speaking time. I could be teaching you for 10 minutes rather than us turning in a Bible 
for, for, for uh, 20 minutes. So that's why, you know, these days, you know, like people, there's a stigma, seems like, in fundamental churches that if you don't come to church with a paper Bible, then you're somehow less spiritual than somebody that uses the Bible on their phone. I, I, I thought we were for technology. Like, technology makes your life easier. It means I don't have to carry everything. I've got the phone. I've got my Bible on my phone. I mean, what difference does it make if it's in, in paper or not? Um, it's just a different medium. So those are my thoughts there. Hopefully that you know, gives you a bit of idea you know, why, why I decide to do this, why I, go to, why I go to the effort of setting this up. It's so that everyone's on the same page. It's easier for us. But, but most importantly, I think it's so that parents can still follow along with the sermon when they don't have the hands to hold a Bible and things like that. Sorry, that's a, that's a bit of just something extra. I just thought I'd talk about that because, you know, in true PowerPoint church style fashion, I am done a PowerPoint today because um, I wanted to um, put the verses in here. I had some positive feedback from my last couple of sermons, uh, just people saying, you know, when you underline the different verses, you underline the words, it makes it a lot more easier to follow. So I thought I would do that just so when I talk about the different verses, I can get you guys to focus on what words I'm focusing on. So I'll try and breeze through this because obviously I've only got about 40 minutes now and um, there's a lot to go through in this sermon. So why bad things happen? Why bad things happen? Now, first of all, just to talk about God's plan, right? You know, a lot of people that don't know their Bible really well, don't know, you know, just, you know, why do bad things happen in the world? Often you get people ask, you know, if there's a loving God, why do bad things happen? And, and really, they have these false presuppositions, right? Because they, they don't know about the fall. They don't know that God didn't create the world as we see it right now. God created the world perfect, without pain, without suffering, without problems, without any sin. But what happened? Adam ate of the fruit of the tree, disobeyed God, and now this world has a curse on it. It's broken. So we live in a cursed world. We live in a world that is not perfect, and that's why there is suffering. That's why there is pain. That's why bad things happen. That is one of the reasons. Um, another false assumption that people have when they ask that question, when they say, if there's a loving God, why do bad things happen? Well, they're assuming that a loving God doesn't allow bad things to happen, right? Right? I mean, who, who, who's, who's, dis, who's deciding who God is? Does God tell us who he is or do we tell God who he is? We, we're saying to God, hey, I thought you were loving. Why are you letting things, bad things happen? But if God is allowing bad things to happen, obviously a loving God, that's part of being a loving God. If he's allowing it to happen, uh, who are we to question God's love just because he doesn't do things the way we think they ought to be done? So two important things to note when we ask that question, if there's a loving God, why do bad things happen? Number one, the world is not perfect. It was cursed by sin and, and Adam's, uh, Adam's sin. And the false assumption that a loving God doesn't allow bad things to happen. Now, when we look at God's plan for your life, you may not know this, but God actually plans suffering for your life in the sense that he, he has suffering that he wants you to go through. Look at this. Philippians 1.29, for unto you it is given, right? So it's not that it just happens to you. Like there is some suffering in your life that God actually gives to you to go through because he knows that it's going to make you better. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, right? So God, God's plan is not just for you to believe and not just for you to have faith, but also to suffer for his sake. So there is some suffering that, you, that, there, that God has given to you, that God has planned for you in, for, for, for Jesus Christ's sake, right? Now, when we look at the world, right, and people might ask the question, well, there's all this pain and all this suffering. Why doesn't God do anything about it? You know, people say that, you know, God, why doesn't God do anything about this world, fixing it up? You know, why doesn't he do that? Well, that's because that's not what God's plan is. God's plan is to fix the world by saving and replacing it. It's not, it's not a plan to rehabilitate it. See, people are expecting God to rehabilitate this world and make this world perfect, whereas we need to read the Bible and figure out, you know, God has a different plan. Because a lot of unbelievers are sitting around accusing God of doing nothing and saying, hey, there's all these bad things going on in the world. What is God doing about it? He's doing nothing. No, 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 it's not that he's doing nothing. He's just not doing what they want him to do because they expect him to rehabilitate the world, right? But that's not God's plan. God's plan is not to re rehabilitate the world. His plan is to save the world, right? And then to replace it with something completely new and get as many people saved so that they can be on the new world. Now, keep that in mind when we read Revelation 21. He says, I, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, right? 
For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. So you see how it's not that God is fixing the first earth, he's just replacing it. He's getting rid of the first earth and he's creating a new heaven and a new earth eventually. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. So you see how he's not just fixing things. He's completely like getting rid of it and making a new heaven and a new earth. And he said unto me, right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And who is he that overcometh? It's the people that believe on Jesus Christ. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. So here's the, two, the, the, the dichotomy, right? So he's making a new heaven and a new earth. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things. So these are the people that are saved, right? Verse 8, now this is the context of verse 8, the verse that we normally share when we go out soul winning. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So you see how God's plan is not to rehabilitate the world, it's to totally replace it. And he's just trying to, trying to get as many people saved as possible. And we're not saved by works. You know, it's, it's, it's not by works lest any man should boast. For by grace are you saved through faith. Um, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And this overcoming is even alluded to in verse 6 when it says, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. It's free to be saved. If you have to work in order to be saved, you have to follow Jesus and keep the commandments or repent of your sins to be saved. That's works. That's not grace. That's not free. Free is Jesus paid it all. You know, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. All we have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The opposite of that, if you do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will have sin and those people are thrown into the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, something interesting on that point with God replaced, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but in Matthew 9, it reads here, no man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment. So just notice that, this is this new and this old. For that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish but they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. I always wonder like what that parable was referring to and how we can apply it. Um, I think there is, I think I figured out one application of this parable because remember he's saying, you know, you don't take, you don't to try and fix this old garment, you don't take a new garment and then cut it up and then patch up the old one. You just replace it with a new garment. And it's the same with wine. You don't put new wine into old bottles. You need to put new wine into new bottles. So this idea that God does not rehabilitate, he totally replaces it with something new. Well, notice what he, what he says in Hebrews 1, verse 10 to here. It says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old, as doth a garment. So you see how the world here that God created, it's waxing old and it's being actually compared to a piece of clothing, a garment, saying that this piece of clothing is getting old. Now, what about that parable in Matthew, right? Where he says, you don't put a piece of a new cloth onto an old garment, right? This old garment that is waxing old. That's not what God's going to do. Remember, he's going to fix it and replace it. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as, a vex and as a vesture, so what's a vesture? It's a piece of clothing as well, right? Shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall fail not. So isn't that interesting that we read in Revelation that God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. We have this parable about not putting an old garment onto a new garment, and then God actually compares the world as a garment that is waxing old, and one day he's just going to fold it up, and he's going to replace it. So I just thought that, that was interesting there. Now, when we talk about bad things happening, um, what are the causes? What, what causes bad things to happen, right? Because they're not all caused by the same thing. 
There's four things I want to go through uh, of what causes bad things in the world. Because sometimes people will blame God and say, oh, if there's a loving God, you know, why are these bad things happening? But a lot, sometimes the bad things aren't caused by God. You know, God has given us free will. We have the free will to choose and to decide what we want to do. So with free will comes responsibility. With free will comes the ability to sin, the ability to harm other people, the ability to harm ourselves, right? And we don't want to forget as well that there's a spiritual world out there. So we'll go through these different causes of um, what causes suffering. So the first one I want to cover is self-inflicted suffering. Self-inflicted suffering. So we'll read here in Galatians 6, it says here, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Right? So when you sin, you're not, it's not only the wages of sin is death, where if you don't get saved, you go to hell. But if you sin, there are consequences, right? Like people that commit fornication end up uh, you know, in, uh, contracting sexually transmitted diseases. You know, people that break the law, you get fines. People, if you murder somebody, you might lose your life in some countries. You might be put, to jail for the, get, get put in jail for the rest of your life. If you commit adultery, you might, you know, you might uh, you know, uh, you know, ruin your marriage. You ruin your family. Now your kids are not brought up properly. And this causes a lot of suffering as well. It sometimes sets off a chain reaction. Um, let's go on. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who have the household of faith. So there is this principle in the Bible that you reap what you sow, right? And it's the same with suffering. If you are not taking care of yourself, then you sometimes will reap what you sow. You might make a foolish decision. You know, we've all made foolish decisions in our life and we've had to reap the consequences, haven't we? Now, we, can we blame that on God? Can we, can we say, why is God doing this to me? Why is Satan doing this to me? When it was a consequence of your own foolish decision? For example, you know, smoking, family breakups, poor financial decisions. You know, these are things where we have made the decision to do this and sometimes there's a consequence. How can we blame anyone else but ourselves in those situations? You know, if you get sick, for example, because you don't look after your health, like if you never cared about what you ate, you don't think about your diet, you don't think about exercise, you don't think about these things and then you get diseases when you're older, can you say Satan is doing this to me? God is doing this to me? If you never took care of your health? You know, and those of us who are young, we get away with it when we're young. You know, we can be unhealthy, right? We can eat whatever stuff we want. But wait until you're older, you know, you, that, that stuff is going to catch up to you. But is it God's fault, right? That's not God's fault when, when you just reap what you sow. And I just think of people, you know, like, you know, sometimes, you know, when I talk about organic things with colleagues and with friends or whatever, you know, you talk about organic and you talk about the fluoride in the water and supplementation and, you know, uh, you, you tell people, you know, I, I don't want to eat too much ca candy. I don't, I don't feed my kids too much candy. And they're always like, ah, oh, you know, you, you're so, uh, you know, you, you, you're, what do they say? You're just like depriving them of, of, of being a kid and depriving them of this. And why don't you just live? And they mock you for being healthy, right? But then who's going to have the last laugh, right? When, when I'm 50 or 60, I can still walk. I still have a sound mind. And, and you know, they have all these uh, degenerative diseases. Um, you know, it's, that's just what it reminds me of people that just make fun of people for being healthy. And then later on, you know, they, they, they have all these health issues and then they think it's a spiritual attack. They think it's God doing this to them. And it's like, well, did you take care of yourself when you were younger? Um, so that's an example of just suffering that is caused by yourself. You know, it's self-inflicted. Right? What about suffering that is inflicted by others? You know, often people will say, like, what about the wars, right? Um, you know, what about all these, um, this, the starvation that we see in the world? And, and, you know, people don't have food, people don't have clean water, um, you know, people have health problems, and that could be caused by the mass vaccinations that is, is forced on the population. Uh, we don't know. But, um, you know, people often look at that and say, you know, if there's a loving God, why is all this happening? Well, it's because God is not causing that. God has given us free will, and usually it's men that is causing that. There is, there is pain and there is suffering and there is bad things that is caused and inflicted by other men, right? Let's have a look at a couple of examples in the Bible. Jeremiah 32, 35, And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, 
to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech, which I commanded them not. See, so God is saying they're doing this wicked thing where they're sacrificing their, their sons and their daughters into the fires to a false god. He says, I didn't command them to do it, neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. So God's like saying, I didn't even think of this stuff. This wasn't even in my mind. It, but wicked people thought of this stuff, that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Look at what it says in James 4, uh, verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? So we talk about wars and starvation and oppression. This is, all, this is generally people in power, the, the, people, the puppet masters behind pulling the strings, making all this happen and people fighting each other. You know, is it the banks or whatever? Ultimately, it's Satan at the top, right? Uh, making all these things happen. He says, from whence? For, so from where, right? Come wars and fightings among you. Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members. So you see, this is lust of men and they're inflicting pain on other people. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have. Right? So this is what men are doing to other men. They are murdering. They are killing other people. It's not God doing this, right? It's not Satan doing this. It's just men of their own lust. Ye lust and have not. It says in verse 1, even of your own lust, your lust that war in your members, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. And it goes on in, in James 4. Let's look at another one, verse Timothy 6.10. This is probably the, you know, this tells us the root of all evil, all harm that is in the world. For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, a lot of people have a wrong understanding of this passage, right? First of all, money is not evil, right? It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil because money is neutral. Money is just a tool. You know, money is just a conversion of material possession into an, a, a medium of exchange, right? Whether it's gold or silver or whether you know, the government forces you to use pieces of plastic, you know, that, the, the currency. Um, you know, that's all money is. It's neutral, right? You can use it for good. You can use it for evil, right? Now, the love of money is the root of all evil, not money itself. Now, what I want you to notice here as well is that the love of money is the root of all evil. It is not the cause of all evil, right? So I'm, I'm just showing you this passage. I'm not saying that the love of money causes all suffering that's inflicted by other people. I'm just saying this is one thing, right? This is one thing that can cause suffering. It's not, this verse is not teaching that it causes all evil to everybody. This is what some people misunderstand. So it doesn't say the love of money is the cause of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, what's the difference between a cause and a root, right? A cause is when it's like an action and then a reaction, right? So people sometimes understand this. So love of money must be somehow linked to every single evil that I see in the world. No, that's not what I believe this verse is teaching. What is a root? A root, if you think about the root of a tree, like the root of a tree is what gives that tree sustenance, right? It gives that tree stability. So when the roots go in, that's how the tree draws in its minerals and whatnot, its water. It also makes that tree terribly difficult to pull out of the ground. Right? If you guys were there, Alex was there at the old house and we were trying to pull that tree. They didn't actually pull the roots out of the ground. They just ended up hacking the roots off and just <laughs> pulling the tree off because that's what a root does. The root, the root digs in deep, it gets sustenance and it gets stability. And that's what the love of money does to evil. The love of money, what it does to evil, it's the root of all evil because the love of money can fuel evil and it keeps evil there as long as the love of money is there. That's how I understand this. Now what you have to note as well is that the love of money is not the root of all sin. Right? So it says the love of money is the root of all evil. Now evil is when you harm somebody else. But not all sin harms somebody else in the sense that you can sin. You could think a foolish thought and things like that. So it's not saying that if you think a foolish thought, that was because of the love of money. Because this is how, if, if you misunderstand this verse, that's what you can kind of think about. It's like, okay, so the thought of foolishness is sin. Well, what does that got to do with the love of money? Well, if you think the love of money is the cause of all sin, then you're going to have a problem trying to figure that out. But if you realize the love of money is the root of all evil, now it makes a bit more sense, right? So hopefully that clears a bit up for you for this passage. But we can see here that suffering is caused by others as well. So we have suffering that's self-inflicted. We have suffering that is caused by others. Um, now we, have, we can get into the spiritual one, where there is suffering that is caused by Satan. So I'm not saying that, not, uh, that, that God and Satan don't have any part to play in the suffering that we see in this world. 
I'm just making the point that not all suffering is from Satan. Not all suffering is from God. There are different causes for suffering. Suffering that's self-inflicted, suffering that's inflicted by um, others. But let's look at suffering that is inflicted by Satan and his angels. You know, And I might not get into... I probably, I probably won't finish my sermon today because this, this, this part's a bit long and I've only got 20 minutes left. <laughs> but suffering that's inflicted by Satan and his angels. Now, one thing you might not know is that Satan's not the only one going around causing all this suffering in the world, right? Number one, not all suffering is caused by him. But number one, Satan can't be in multiple places at once, right? Now, Satan is not like the, the opposite of God. It's not like in Greek mythology and Roman, uh, Roman mythology, right? Where you have like the good God and then you have the bad God and they're pretty much equal, but it's just one's reigning in heaven and one's reigning in hell. That's not what Satan is. Satan is a cherubim, which is, a, which is some sort of angelic being with wings. We're not sure exactly what it is, but the Bible talks about him being the anointed cherub, right? So he is a created being. He was actually created perfect till sin was found in him. He sinned against God, right? And became what we know now as the devil, as Satan. Basically, he's the leader of, of all these evil people and evil devils that are following him, right? His angels. Um, so this is one thing, that he is not eternal. Satan is not eternal, and he's a created being, right? He's, he was a created being that sinned against God. That means Satan is not everywhere. Get, Satan is not omnipresent like God is. God is everywhere, in every believer, everywhere at the same time uh, at once, right? But Satan isn't. So you can't have two believers saying, Satan made me do it at the same time on opposite sides of the world, because Satan's not in both locations. Right? And also, Satan doesn't know what you're thinking. So you can't say that, you know, oh, Satan's, you know, doing, making me do this because he doesn't know what you're thinking. But he does understand the nature of man. He can influence. That's why the Bible says that Satan can fill your heart with things, right? So he, his, his words out there, his spirit out there can influence you. But, you know, unless you actually become possessed by a devil, they're not taking control of you. They, they, don't, they can't read your mind. They can't be in multiple places at once. That's why the satanic war, the demonic forces that are out there are the, are the devil and his angels. There are multiple demons out there causing havoc and, and, and maybe tormenting people and whatnot. So the Bible says here in Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. 1 Peter 5, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Revelation 2.10, fear none of those things without which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. So you see how the devil is causing some of these afflictions? Actually, specifically him that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Here's another one from uh, 2 Corinthians 12. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. So was this Satan that was actually buffeting Paul? Or was it one of his angels, a messenger of Satan? We don't know who this messenger is. A lot of people believe that what Paul was experiencing was some sort of health problem, right? An infirmity. Um, who knows whether it was influenced by satanic influences? Or is he actually talking about somebody that was, you know, was, was it the, the messenger of Satan that, was, that Paul was praying to get rid of? Was it actually somebody that was giving him a hard time? Um, you know, I think both could fit this passage. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Right? Isn't that a great attitude to have when we go through struggles? is that we take pleasure in them because we know that God can get glory from the things that we struggle with if we uh, strive lawfully, right? If we do the right thing. Now, I want to go through this story in Job because I think it's really interesting. It gives us a bit of insight into what Satan is capable of, right? What Satan is capable of. Um, and I might not get 
through all of it, but Job 1. Let's just read from verse 6. I think this story is really interesting. It says here, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now I don't know if you guys know my position. You can go listen to my sermon called uh, The Angels That Sinned, and I go over who I believe the sons of God are. I do believe the, the, the phrase the sons of God can refer to angels, and I believe specifically here it was the angels. But, um, you know, that, that's another topic. But uh, this is what I believe it's saying here, that the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them, right? But I, I don't actually believe Satan is an angel, you know? Um, a lot of people think Satan is a fallen angel. Um, I believe he's a, a, a sinful cherubim. Uh, but a cherubim is not specifically an angel. And the reason why I think that is because cherubim and seraphim in the Bible have wings, right? The seraphim fly, you know, they're on either side of God saying, holy, holy, holy. The cherubims, if you remember, on either side of the Ark of the Covenant had the wings going over the mercy seat. So cherubims are an angelic being that have wings. But nowhere in the Bible do you ever see angels have wings. I don't know if you noticed that. That's just something I don't know the movies have just taught us to believe. But I tried to find a passage where angels have wings. I don't think they have wings. And in fact, every time you see an angel, they're like men, right? You see angels and they're looking like men. If you saw a guy with two eagle's wings, I mean, that doesn't look like a man. So um, I personally don't think angels have wings. And I personally don't think Satan is an angel. But I do think Satan, as a cherubim that sinned, has convinced a third of the angels to do his bidding, right? So he has his angels, um, but he's not necessarily an angel. Um, that's what I believe right now. Um, happy to be proven wrong on that. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? So from where did you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So you can see here that Satan is not this God of, the, of, the, of, the, of hell. Remember we read in Matthew 25 that God said to Satan, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So you see, hell is a place that was created to punish angels and the devil as well, right? As well as people that don't get saved. So Satan is not ruling and reigning in hell. I mean, Satan is just a cherubim. But also, Satan has not yet been cast out of heaven, right? So a lot of people think that Satan is this fallen angel that fell out of heaven and he's not allowed back in there. No, because here he is before God and God is saying, for where did you come from? And he's like, I'm walking to and fro in the earth, you know, and going to, walking up and down in it. And now he's back presenting himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Now, I think this verse is an allusion to the covenant of grace, because obviously Job was a sinner, right? The only sinless man is, is Jesus Christ. But why can God look at Job and say a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? It's because he's looking at him through the eyes of grace, right? Because he is also finding grace in the eyes of the Lord, just like Noah and just like um, Abraham did. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, doth Job, doth Job fear God for naught? So basically Satan is saying to God and saying here, does Job, is Job just like obedient? Is he just faithful just because for nothing? Meaning like, you know, and what does he say? Hast thou not made an hedge about him? So you're like, you're protecting him. And about his house, you know, his, his possessions, and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. So now, Basically, Satan is accusing Job to God, saying the only reason why he's serving you is because you're treating him so nicely, right? You've got a hedge around him. You're giving him so much, so much material possessions. That's the only reason why he's doing it. Verse 11, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath. What is he saying? Like, if you take that all away and he'll curse, he will curse thee to thy face. So, and the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So basically Satan says, you know what? If you take it all away, then you see he'll curse you to your face. So God says, all right, I'll, I'll let you do that. You go, as long as you don't touch him, you can do anything else, right? And Satan goes to, to, to then go and give Job some trouble. Verse 13, and there was a day when his sons and his daughter, daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest, bro eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. So what's happening? This is Job's possessions, right? And, and one of his servants comes to him and says, You know, the oxen were plowing and feeding. 
and the Sabaeans, so people from another country, basically foreign invaders, come and have taken them away. So he's lost his oxen, right? Yea, and they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So you see here that he's lost his oxen, but also his servants. So we see here that Satan has the power to actually send a foreign army to take away possessions, right? To take away your material possessions, but also the, the ability to, to start like a fight in the sense that he's, he sent these people to go and kill the servants. So whilst there, like we talked about in James 4, there is wars that is caused by our own lust and desires, but there are also wars that are specifically caused by Satan. Isn't that an interesting thing there? That Satan can actually, uh, what's the word um, when you coordinate? He can actually coordinate these things. He has the power to do that. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep. So remember, he lost his oxen, his, his ca cattle. Now he's losing his sheep, right? And the servants. So he's losing on all these farms. He's not only losing the, the, the livestock, he's also losing the, the people, that, the servants that are looking after that livestock. And it burned up the sheep and the servants and it consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now, what I want to point out in this verse is it's interesting that when the fire of God, well, when the fire came down, right, what did the servant say? The fire of God is fallen down, right? Is fallen from heaven. Now, let me ask you, was it the fire of God? No, because who was doing this? Satan. Satan went to go tempt Job. Satan sent the fire down, but man automatically assumes God is doing it. The fire of God has fallen down. And isn't that what happens when there's, sometimes there's a tsunami? Sometimes there's a natural, a natural disaster that happens. And what do we say? Oh, it was an act of God. Was it an act of God? How do you know it's not an act of Satan? How do you know Satan didn't cause it so that he can get sympathy for one of his agendas? I don't know. He's got all these agendas going on. So he can get some sympathy for like a wicked nation or something like that and, and totally change people's perception of things that are going on, you know? So it's interesting there that this fire comes down, burns up the sheep and the servants, and the servant's initial reaction is that it's from God when it was from Satan. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels. So now he's, he's lost his oxen, he's lost his sheep, now he's losing his camels, right? And have carried them away, yea, and the slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only have escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, so can you imagine what's going on? I mean, these servants are coming to him, just one, and it's, he's lost it all at the same time. You know, these servants all come at the same time. While he was yet speaking, the next servant comes. There came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. You know, so sometimes there will be a disaster, right? And we lose loved ones. We lose family members. Was that God that caused that? You know, you might think, you know, well, why did a loving God allow that? You know, I mean, ultimately allowed it. We'll get to that at the end if I have some time, which I probably won't. But um, it's not always God that's causing it. You see here. We see, we see here that Satan not only has the power to send fire from heaven, but he has the power also to, to send what we would might see as a hurricane or a tornado, right? To, to blow down a house. A great wind from the wilderness. So some people just think, oh, it's just Mother Nature. You know, it could be spiritual forces that are, at, that are at work making these things happen, you know, making us go through these afflictions and struggles. And smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So we see Job is losing his material possessions. He's losing his business. He's, use, he's losing family members from what only he can perceive as natural disasters or disasters that maybe God has caused, like the fire from heaven. Because the great wind, you might think, is a natural disaster. But when fire is coming down from heaven, I mean, that's not a natural disaster, right? You're kind of thinking, why is God sending fire down? When you don't realize, no, Satan has the power to send fire down as well. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. 
Now that's something we're often guilty of, right? When we, when we go through bad things, when we go through suffering, sometimes we charge God foolishly and we say, why did God do this? When we don't think, maybe it's not God that's doing it, right? Or, you know, you have health problems, right? And we charge God foolishly and we say, why is God doing this when it was just self-inflicted or it was inflicted by others or whatnot? So we don't want to, when we go through troubles, when we go through struggles, that we charge God foolishly. Also, we want to reflect on how Job actually responded when he lost everything. Because oftentimes we have, our life is going well, everything's going fine, and we think we're so godly, we're so righteous that, yeah, I, I am content. You know, I'm content with everything I've had because everything's going smooth for me, right? I've got enough money in the bank, I've got a house to live in, uh, I'm comfortable, I've got a job. You know the, tr the real test of contentment, the real test of whether or not you are happy, which is what content means, right? Content means that you are happy with what you have um, and, and you're happy in God is when you lose it all. When you lose, when you lose something, are you still content? That's what is good to reflect on when, when you think, am I really a content person? Well, why when I lose something, I'm so upset? You know, when I lose my job, I'm just, my life just goes to, 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 to rubbish and I'm just, I'm not content anymore. This is the real test of contentment is, are you still content when you lose, you know, when you lose, when you lose everything? And, and we see here that Job reacted the right way. And you know, this is how we learn contentment. In Philippians 4, I wanted to share this verse with you. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. So you see, what teaches you contentment? Sometimes the reason why God wants you to go through suffering is because he wants you to experience both and then you actually learn to truly be content, not just deceive yourself that you are content just because everything's going well for you. He wants some suffering to come into your life so that you, ab you abound and you're abased. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both. Just notice, that's why I've underlined it, both abase and abound, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, and therefore, right, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Why was Paul able to say this, right? Yes, he had faith in Christ, but also he experienced both. He abounded and he was abased, and that's why he learned contentment. He learned contentment. See, contentment is not something that is natural, right? Because natural in the flesh is that if things are going well, I'm content, and when things are going bad, I'm discontent. But Paul is saying here, for I have learned it's something he had to learn, right? Through experiencing these things in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Now let's just continue into Job 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? For there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath he will give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. So now he's saying, no, oh, if you lose everything, now he's going to affect Job's health, right? And he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So basically God says to Satan, you can do whatever you want to him, right? But you can't take his life. You can't kill him. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. Now, I feel for Job here because, you know, I suffer from eczema, right? And I've had really bad breakouts where I have sores from my feet to my head. And it's not just covering my body. And that's bad enough. Like, it's hard to sit down. It's hard to have a shower. It's hard to go to bed. I mean, you have to constantly keep them dry and dress them. And, oh man, I would not wish that on anybody. And so when I read Job's experience where he has these sore boils, you can just imagine these huge pussy boils and they're all over his body. Um, and he took him a pot shirt to scrape himself with all and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. So not only has he lost everything, he's got the sore boils 
And now even his wife is charging God foolishly and turning on him and just saying, you know, why are you still trying to hold your integrity? Just curse God and, and die. He doesn't even want him to, to live anymore. Um, but he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And in all this did not Job sin with his lips. So I just wanted to share these couple of verses with you to show other things that Satan is capable of. Remember, we saw that he's capable of creating wars, foreign invaders. He's capable of sending fire from heaven, creating natural disasters. Um, he's capable of killing people, right? He's also capable of giving incurable diseases, right? So sometimes when you are trying all you can to stay healthy and you still have something that is uncurable, I mean, this could just be something that God is allowing in your life that Satan has caused in your life or a, of a demonic force when there's an incurable disease. So sometimes we're not aware, and, and, and I hope that you get at least this from this first half of this sermon, is that not all pain and suffering is caused by God. There are different causes to pain and suffering. And I hope right now you get a better picture of what Satan and what devils are capable of. Now, the last one I just want to cover, and then I'll finish it here, is just, of course, God also can inflict suffering as well. You know, I'm not saying God, God is to totally does not cause suffering. God does inflict pain and suffering on people as well. But we need to realize that not all suffering is inflicted by God. Ultimately, God allows all suffering, but um, he does not inflict all suffering. 1 Corinthians 3, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, right, and what is it referring to? Your body, right? If you don't take care of your body, and one of them, one way is to not take care of your body is to fornicate, right? Fornication is one way you can sin against your own body, right? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So you know what? God, at one point, he can get so sick of your sin, so sick of you defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is your body, that he will just take your life, right? He will just remove you from this earth. And he has done this before, right? I won't turn to this passion, but we talked about Ananias and Sapphira last week, right? Where what was their sin? Their sin was giving something to church and lying about how much they gave. And what happened? God just struck them both dead there and then. Right? So God is able to cause suffering. He is able to cause death. He is able to cause incurable diseases. And this is why we ought not you know, just think of God flippantly as a God that we can just walk all over. If you just keep sinning, blatantly sinning, not caring what God thinks, God will one day come and chastise you in love. Not, right? not as a curse, but in love. Hebrews 12. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So you see, God's not going to let you get away with sin. Just like a, a good parent, I don't let my kids get away with anything. If they speak the wrong things, if they do the wrong things, I'm not going to let them get away with it because I want to correct them. I need to chastise them. I need to bring some suffering into their life so that it brings that peaceable fruit of righteousness um, unto them which are exercised thereby, right? This chastening. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 11, another example where God brings death and he brings suffering, right? He brings, you know, uh, sickness for sins that people are committing. And we see here where people were not treating the Lord's Supper correctly. It says here, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So you remember in the first, in the Corinthian church, remember how they were not doing the Lord's Supper properly. They weren't waiting for each other. They weren't discerning the Lord's body. And because they weren't doing that properly, some of them were weak and sickly and some of them were, had died because of it, right? Because that was God's chastisement on this church. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So you see, where, where the unbeliever is not necessarily chastened by God, why? Because when they die, they're going to they're die and burn in hell, right? That's their condemnation for not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. God doesn't have to chastise them. But we, because we are saved 
and we and you know and the more we sin the more grace abounds we're not going to be condemned to hell god chastens us we are judged in this life and that's why pain and suffering can be brought on by god now i, I won't i touched on ananias and sapphire last week i just wanted to bring this to your attention just as another example of pain and suffering that god did i think i'll cover the second part which i'll go into the reasons why um, God allows this suffering and the, the way it helps us to grow. I'll, I'll cover this uh, next week just because we're, we're, we're running a bit late on time. But I hope you, hopefully you learned something. And if you want to hear the, the second part of the story, um, we'll cover that um, next week.